Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you all for coming here to hear about my research about labor migrants in Israel. Um, the work I'm presenting today is indeed part of a larger project that I've been working on for the last two years with Dr. Hani Tubita, who's an Israeli political scientist at the Max Stern School in Israel. And we've been examining where the social borders are in Israel, between Israelis, between Israelis and foreign workers. Um, and when I use the term foreign workers, I'm talking about temporary labor migrants. Foreign workers is the of use in Israel. And we're looking really ethnic state can manage the influx of non-co-ethnic, people who are different from themselves. Um, what does it mean for the state, for the Israeli population, and for the farm workers themselves? So before I begin, I'd like to thank the committee for this opportunity. I'd like to thank the provost for sponsoring this series, and I'd also like to thank um, Assistant Provost Holger Henke for kind of shepherding me through this process. Um, my chair, my department, uh, has been extremely uh, supportive of my research endeavors, and I'd also like to say that I've really benefited from a lot of generous support uh, from collegiality at York. Um, in my department, we discuss research problems um, from the sociology department, Beth Rosenthal has TV, um, a women's research um, network where we've been presenting with each other, and, uh, and um, Shinbai, Bonnie Oblensky, Kandalini, and Rebecca Mastro have been discussing research ideas already for a whole year. Michael Sharp and Mark Schuler have been very gracious about providing comments on papers. And when faculty heard about my project, they really came almost out of the woodwork to offer their very generous support, um, providing me with some language translations. And we're hoping to implement a survey tool using these language translations. Shinbai provided a Chinese translation, Zora Sad um, Kariya provided a French translation, and the mother of Kapriya Makro, Nualchar Kun Sim Kyang, provided a Thai translation. I'm sure I got chocolate for me, but I'm very grateful. Um, and I also have a pleasure that of one of my students, um, who was a Spanish major, who heard that he was doing that I was doing this kind of research and offered to provide a Spanish translation. Um, so to um, Juan Racino, so I'm really very grateful for the opportunity to do an internship with him and show him how his language skills can be used outside of literature. Finally, I have the good fortune to work with Dr. Laura Fishman, my on-campus mentor, and the provost himself who's been pushing me um, to do more with my research. So um, it's really nice to take the opportunity to thank people who have helped me along the way. Um, the topic that I'm going to be looking at really is looking at how Israel deals with the top, with the with the problem, with the problem of foreign workers. We you know in political science that something is an issue until so somebody complains about it and it becomes a problem, something that has to be solved. So Israel is like many states around the world that is experiencing this kind of problem. It's a state that's in tremendous um, uh, global, because of globalization, tremendous demographic flux. This is not unique to Israel, but it's especially problematic in an ethnic state. Um, there was a Max Frisch once quip that they call for workers, but people came instead. This is a problem with foreign workers. States need their labor, um, but they are not so excited about the immigrants who come and start to threaten and change some of the local community. They strain the self-definition of the ethnic state as an ethnically homogeneous place. And they really create, um, they have the propensity to create a great deal of social, economic, and political unrest. And this is especially true in ethnic states because they're considered places that house um, the nation. In immigration states, states like the United States, or um, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, they have also these kinds of problems with, with immigrants, as we know from here. But their self-definition is very different because they're based on the concept of immigrants coming in. So this is the difference between ethnic states, where the state houses the nation, and immigration states, um, where, they, where really it's many people coming from many different places and agree to come and be together. So we see this, this kind of conflict in ethnic states around the world, where they're seeing increasing numbers of foreign workers who come to stay. In places like Japan and Germany, Korea, Ireland, and Israel, we see that increasingly there are problems dealing with new populations that nobody ever imagined and now have to be incorporated into the ethnic whole. 
So my partner and I decided we wanted to look at Israel as really a prototypical example of an ethnic state. Israel is a planned state. It was designed as a Jewish state to house the Jewish people. And so the, the idea of Israel and Jewishness are intrinsically linked to each other. When we think of faces in Israel, I speculate you might think of these kinds of faces. Orthodox, secular, kibbutzniks, soldiers, perhaps even of Israeli Arabs, of Bedouins. And these do indeed represent 95% of Israel's population. However, if I show you other pictures, I'm wondering if you would imagine them as Israeli. Filipinos, Congolese, Chinese, Indian, Thai, Nepalese, and um, Ghanaian. All of these are, are, um, are new faces in Israel. Population of Israel essentially is 75% Jewish, 20% Arab, and 5% other. And this other category is increasingly growing. Um, you can see from this chart, this is a, this is a table, it's, it's the, the most modern figure that the Israeli government provides, it's from 2008. This is a chart of the legal workers in Israel. The Israeli government, is about 115,000 here, the Israeli government knows that this is about one third of the foreign workers that are in Israel, and that there are about more than 300,000 foreign workers currently in Israel, two thirds of whom are illegally present. So, the question comes down, can they be Israeli? They're not Jews, they're not Arabs. The children are born and raised in Israel. And they themselves very frequently describe themselves as Israeli. But if Israel accepts them, what does it mean for Israel? And if Israel rejects them, what does it mean? So, I'm going to look a little bit at some of these basic issues and thinking about basic premises of citizenship theory and thinking about um, the Israeliness Jewishness debate. Is there a link between being Jewish and being Israeli? Then finally coming to issues about the foreign workers, who they are, how they got to Israel, um, and our, our own research with the foreign workers and our research findings. And finally talk about some of the possibilities for accommodation in Israel. So in order to understand what belonging is, belonging in a legal context includes very, um, very basic principles in citizenship. These are three citizenship orientations, which are the basic ways that people relate to their state. Um, the first one is the one that we're most familiar with in the United States. It's a concept of via soli, which means it's the law of the soil. If you're born in the United States, I'll use this example, since 1868, you are a citizen of the United States. It doesn't matter what your parents are. It doesn't matter how long they've been here. It doesn't matter if they're legally present or a citizen of the United States. Um, in contrast, um, ia sanguinis is a law of blood. So ia sanguinis means that it matters who your parents are. What your parents' citizenship is determines what your citizenship is. And it doesn't matter where you're born or how long you've lived in that place. Five years, 10 years, 50 years, you're still not a member of that state. It's dependent on your parentage. And finally, the last one, ia domicili, is a citizenship of place. If you happen to be present in that place, that makes you a citizen. Um, these three issues are really the fundamental issues in what the, the um, context is for, uh, for the problem of foreign workers. Um, all of these kinds of citizenship orientations are used in every state as a way of, great, of determining who the insiders are and who the outsiders are whom to give preferential treatment to, who's allowed to stay, who can work in that place. And since this class is, since this section is meeting during my public administration class, I have to say it's also a way for the state to easily describe citizenship for matters of state public administration. Um, the Israeli citizenship has been based on Ia Sanguinis, on a law of blood. There's an expectation that if you are a Jew, you should find welcome in Israel. This has been the law of Israel since 1950 and is codified in something called the Law of Return. Um, in 1970, in a hope of bringing more um, Jews from the Soviet Union, Israel amended this law to make it also that if you were related to a Jew, 
you could also come to Israel. And they actually adopted the 1935 Nuremberg Law on the Nazi code for its determination of who's a Jew and who's not, with the expectation um, that if someone's life was threatened for being Jewish, that person should find refuge in Israel. And um, that's been the law since 1970. And it's actually been used extremely frequently in the last few years, something that I'll get to at the end. When the Russian, uh, when there was a huge Russian migration to Israel, more than a million people came to Israel looking for, um, for Israeli citizenship. And about 300,000 of them are Christians. It was the first time in Israel's history that such a large group had come to Israel and demanded Israeli citizenship, not because they were Jews, but because they were related to Jews. And they've had a major impact on the Israeli political scene and social scene and, and a host of other things. Um, the last group, Israeli citizenship, is also based on bias domicili, on this law of, of place, of domicile. And this is what was available to Arabs. Any Arabs who who remained in Israel at the founding of the State of Israel, they and their children um, uh, retain a right of citizenship in Israel. So Israel is very much at this point in an identity crisis. The State of Israel is more than 60 years old. And even though from the outside, we think that the main border issue is the, is the border between um, Jews and Arabs, between Israel and the Palestinians, if you look a little closer, there are other border issues and other border concerns. And these are really the definitions of what it is to be an Israeli. And really for Israel to come to terms with what it is to be a Jewish, democratic, and liberal state. Um, the proclamation of the Declaration of the State of Israel says that the State of Israel is open for Jewish immigration and the ingathering of the exile. Um, that all Jews should find a place in Israel. And until recently, for most of us, when we thought Israeli, we thought Jewish. And citizenship was based on this, this, on this Jewish ancestry. So the key problem was figuring out who's a Jew, not what's an Israeli. This decision of who's a Jew was not decided by civil authorities in Israel. Actually, it was decided by the religious authorities who maintain control of that ministry in Israel. And they decide what it is to be a Jew. And if they don't they determine that you don't meet their criteria, you don't come into Israel. And this has been true for converts and for a host of other people um, in, in Israel. So really questioning what it is to, to who's a Jew um, and what it is to be an Israeli is done by the religious authorities, not by the civil authorities. Israeli Arabs, to be very frank, have been considered very much an inconvenient reality, and Israel has by and large really not dealt with the Arab identity issues within the Israeli state. Um, all Jews um, are returning home to Israel. There is no such thing as immigration to Israel. There are no legal categories. It's not possible. You're either returning home or you're there on a short stay. You're a sojourner. So all Jews have a claim to citizenship in Israel. Any person who gets to Israel on their landing card, it says, are you coming here for the purpose of becoming a citizen? And um, if you check the box, you go into a queue, and people explain to you then what it is that you need to do in order to establish your residency in Israel. <coughs> At that point, you receive all of the benefits of all citizens of Israel. And um, you are given a, a basket of services, of funds, of housing, subsidies, of language training, job opportunities. It's really made in a way to promote uh, migration to Israel and to keep a Jewish majority in Israel. And that is their key concern. If you're going to have a Jewish state, you need to have a Jewish majority. So the government has done this in three different ways. One is by supporting Jewish immigration. The other is by promoting kinds of pro-birth policies. Um, and promoting, for instance, uh, highly subsidized in vitro fertilization policies for Jewish women, and by preventing non-Jewish migration. But now Israel has a problem, and that problem is it's more than 300,000 temporary labor migrants and their children, um, many of whom are stateless. So this, when the foreign workers came in, it really changed very much the debate it moved from this national debate of who's a Jew to a, to a question of what's an Israeli, and trying to understand if there was any way that there could be any permanence of foreign workers in Israel. Um, 
so this is, it, it goes very much back to even the founding of, um, of Israel and the very philosophical understanding of the founding of the state. At the time of the founding, um, the question was, should the homeland for the Jews be a state that was guided by Jewish principles, or should the, should the Jewish state be a place where the Jewish people live? And this is really, this is a, a more than 100-year-old debate. Um, in the modern um, explanation of it, one of the, the leaders of a, of a political party, Shulamit Aloni, was really chastising the prime minister. Um, this is from last year. Where she says that it's not even sufficient for him to be Israeli. Um, that there's an insistence that Israel be a place for Jews. In contrast, on the other side of the political, um, political aisle, the interior minister, which is from the far right Shas party, he says that um, in respect, with respect to the children of these foreign workers, that they damage the state's Jewish identity, constitute a demographic threat, and increase the danger of assimilation, all of which are, are deemed critical for the sustenance of the Jewish state. This is a very hot, loud, angry debate that takes place on the streets of Israel. And I can't explain to you how um, moving it is to see walking down the streets of Israel people whether small children protesting, I mean, really five-year-olds screaming, do not deport us, do not deport us, and being um, followed by groups of Holocaust survivors in their wheelchairs and walkers demanding that these children be allowed to stay. And they are faced with other people who are screaming and yelling and demanding that these people be forced out. It is a very... Um, a very overwhelming um, experience. So this is um, Israel is at its core, and it's Israel has no constitution. What it has is a basic law, and in the basic <coughs> law, it states that Israel is a Jewish and democratic state. This is the fundamental part of the argument: that what do you do in a Jewish and democratic state if you have people? and large numbers of people, growing numbers of people, who cannot become citizens. There is no possibility for them under Israeli law. So at the crux, the main problem of the foreign workers is that their presence threatens the Jewish nature of the state, but their removal and exclusion threatens the democratic nature of the state. And we're really stuck between these two very difficult um, places. So in trying to understand if there was any kind of um, permanence that could be, or even understanding how the foreign workers fit within Israel, we went out to go and interview them ourselves. And we interviewed at this point 42 foreign workers from 12 different countries to try to understand um, through their thoughts, their experiences, and their opinions on identity, permanence, and belonging for themselves and their children. We really wanted to understand how do they imagine themselves in Israel if they're Israeli, and if they believe that they're being perceived as Israeli, is there a future for them? So let me tell you a little bit of how they got to Israel. Israel has been importing labor since before the establishment of the state in 1948. At that time, prior to 1948, and, and until really until the modern time, Israel brought in workers from the Palestinian, what's now the Palestinian territories. People came in as day laborers, they did their work, and they went home. So they were there only during working time, and then they, they disappeared. So the question of integration really wasn't an important question, because they went back to their own villages. Um, as of the first intifada in 1988, the government decided to seal the borders and didn't allow foreign workers to come, didn't allow the Palestinian workers to come in. As both an effort to undercut Palestinian labor and undercut the, the intifada, and also because of the fact that I told you there were a million Russians who came in at that very time and they were promised housing under Israeli law, under the law of return, Israel suddenly found itself in a quandary. It couldn't build the houses for the Russians and it, um, and it wanted to make sure that it stopped the fighting with the, uh, as part of the Intifada. So what it did was it decided to bring in foreign workers. I have to say I really don't understand how a state could look at um, at this as a solution. In no country in the world has anybody ever brought in workers for a short period of time and they left. 
because it's never happened. <laughs> but they thought they could do it. And when I asked the head of the committee um, for foreign workers in Israel why he thought Israel could do this, he says, Steve, you're under this mistaken impression that there was some thought going on. <laughs> so, um, so Israel decided at that point to bring in foreign workers to build houses and to, to um, take care of crops and, and other things. And they started contracting labor with countries around, around the world and bring in labor for these short-term five-year contracts. You come in and work and then you'd be expected to leave. It was not possible to renew your contract and the people had to pay for a visa in order to come in. Okay, so um, there are essentially several different ways that people become foreign workers in Israel. You are one of these contracted workers who's legally present. You were a legally present worker whose visa ran out. You're legally present but working illegally. You cross the border and you're doing whatever you're doing. You're a refugee and asylum seeker. There are currently 26,000 refugees um, and asylum seekers, mostly from Sudan, South Sudan, and Eritrea in Israel right now. Um, and, uh, and you're a child of any of these other groups. Israel offers, in terms of the contract workers, um, uh, visas in five different categories. Um, the only one that's unlimited is nursing and caregiving. And this is largely because the elderly population in Israel is growing and growing, and there is nobody there to take care of the elderly. So they keep bringing in more workers, predominantly from the Philippines, but also from Nepal, from India, um, and, and uh, Sri Lanka. So the conditions for these temporary labor migrants is a little bit bizarre. First of all, they're there as indentured labor. They're there under a contract. If they lose their job for any reason, they don't like it, they get fired, the time is over, whatever it is, their residency is finished immediately, and they lose their right to residency in Israel. Um, their residency is, is tied to their employment, which means that it puts them in a very precarious situation. How do you complain about a bad working condition if you know you can't stay? If you've already laid out for your contract fee, $2,000, $5,000, $10,000, $30,000 for Chinese workers. How do you pay that back when you're making minimum wage? It would take you, you would have to work constantly in order to make up the money that you owe. So people, many of the workers tend to stay very quiet. The way the government does this is that they issue visas to manpower companies, and these manpower companies make their money from, give, from selling these visas. So the manpower companies want to keep bringing in lots of new people, because everybody who comes in is another $10,000. Um, the people who come to Israel, they may be there and they say, I kind of like it here, I'd like to stay, or I have a good job. Where the woman I take care of is a lovely old lady and I want to stay with her and it's not good for old people to be changing you know, their, their domestic health. So it's good for both of us. And the Israeli government then says that's very nice. We like to have people stay if they want to stay, but the manpower companies that control the visas don't make any money from those people. So they have a real, um, they have a real interest in making people leave. Um, so this is a real problem. The reception in Israel is really quite mixed. Foreign workers maintain full civil rights to participate in all kinds of public life. And as I said, you see them protesting on the street. They have their own newspapers. They run radio programs. They're, they are everywhere. Um, so the civil rights are present. Israel also has a really strong record of producing labor protection. There are times when you can work and not work that are guaranteed by law. There's a grievance process. You have time off for religious observance. All of these things are written into the law. The government has even made a multilingual guide to tell foreign workers what their rights are. But, well, there are no political rights. There are no, or almost no social rights. And the enforcement of these labor rights is a little bit sketchy. There are 12 labor inspectors for the entire nation of Israel. Um, with 7.8 million people, you know how many people they're actually inspecting. Deportation is the only method they have of, re of population control. 
Since you can't let people in, you have to force them to leave. And if they want to stay, you have a problem. So Israel is known for nighttime deportations, going into people's homes and escorting them out of their homes, um, stopping children on their way to school in order to deport them. This is a real problem. Um, until 2011, women were required to send their children out of the country after their paid maternity leave, um, or they would lose their, their residency rights. Now that sounds very harsh. On the other hand, they got 14 weeks of paid maternity leave and mandatory time off, and I'll be very frank with you, that's 14 weeks more than I got working for the city of New York when I had a baby. So you have this very odd juxtaposition of you get rights, but we're going to make things very harsh for you. That law was changed. The Israeli Supreme Court decided that that was illegal and was unconstitutional, um, that it was against the basic law. Um, workers are indeed bound to their, um, to their employers. So you, if you don't like your employer, you can't just switch jobs. And that puts you in a very precarious circumstance. So there's this very mixed, odd place. You can complain, but if you do, you might lose your residency. Um, so we went out to go and talk to these workers and hear from them, in their own words, what it was like to be a foreign worker and if there was any possibility for them in Israel. So we conducted these interviews in Israel. The interviews were conducted um, in, mostly in English, but some were conducted at, the, at their choice in Hebrew, Spanish, or French. They were all digitally recorded. We transcribed them, we coded them, and analyzed them, and we really tried to understand um, how the foreign workers themselves constructed their own work, world. We used a computer-based multi-level relational textual analysis tool called Atlas TI to kind of help us to understand how the people felt um, about their issues, and we did a lot of member checking, and we also did a small survey um, to try to increase trustworthiness. And we discovered a few things about, um, about their experiences as Israelis. Invisibility, arbitrariness, religiosity, permanence, and identity. So despite the fact that they're phenotypically different, as I showed you their faces, you can see they look different than most Israelis. The reality is they felt invisible wherever they went. They perceived that they were treated less than human and that they were valued for their labor and not for their personhood. One of our um, respondents said that um, they don't see you. I am not a caregiver first, I am a human being. This was a very common theme that we heard over and over again. We, I would call me human. I am a human. They also felt that policies were very much arbitrary, that they were existing in this very limbo land kind of place. Um, that they, they never knew what to expect from the police, and especially from the immigration police, and that they made up the rules as they went along. This should be a little troubling in any democratic state. Um, so, they would say that this, uh, another um, one of our interview partners said, one minute they decide, then they change it. It's just like that. It's like you go to the high people, what they say, they totally follow. And just everything happens in the surroundings. It's a little bit balagan. Balagan means a little bit crazy. They never know what to expect. On the other hand, some of them really like this. They said, listen, if I forget my visa and I smile nicely, they'll let me go. Um, this is a problem in any democratic society. Um, they also described very frequently bringing their children with them wherever they went. And there was a film that was made that's called I Am Mommy's Visa, which really expressed this, so that if the police saw the child, the police wouldn't deport the mother. Um, I should say that there is a disproportionate amount of deportation of males over females, and, um, and, that, and, a, and a disproportionate number of people without children being deported over people with children. Okay, so they also talked a lot about religiosity. And this was really kind of interesting. They, when we asked them why they came to Israel, overwhelmingly they said they came for the money. That's not unreasonable. Most foreign workers around the world <coughs> leave their home in order to make money. Um, they also said, though, that they came specifically to Israel to make money. They had heard through other foreign workers that um, the pay was better and they were more likely to be paid. 
um, which is a perennial problem that, um, that especially illegal workers have, but, it's, but these workers really were very much afraid of this. Um, but they also said that religion was, most, was a very important reason for coming, and that they were seeking the religious in Israel and in themselves. Um, they had hoped that, they, they were very surprised by Israeli secularism, you'll see in a second. So, one of them explained to us that, um, that when she came to Israel, she really fulfilled herself as a Christian. And that by coming to work in Israel, she was um, coming for the purpose of God. It's a pretty strong statement. Um, in contrast, uh, one of the other um, uh, interview partners explained that we asked her how she felt about being in Israel. She said, horrible! And the, the tone is wonderful on the, um, on the recording. And I said, well, why horrible? And she said, because the people walk around here almost naked. We heard this over and over, that they would say, I was expecting to find the people like in the Bible. <laughs> and then they would come and they would go to the new beach in Tel Aviv, and they would, you know, it was, it was too much. Um, nobody looked, acted, behaved. And that was also, they expected people to come out and speak like people in the Bible. And they were people who were getting their hair done, you know, buying bananas, whatever it was they were doing. They weren't being very biblical. <laughs> they were swearing very loudly. <laughs> so this was, this was really a problem. Um, they think we very, this was a common concern. Okay, so then we also asked them about, but do you belong? How do you belong and how would they define belonging? And they, they really talked about that being very much on the periphery, that they were very voyeuristic of Israeli life. And this was true whether there was an actual barrier, anybody stopped them or not. And in large part, we speculated from what we heard, there was a lot about language, about work schedules, about limited time off, and that, for instance, caregivers who were very frequently likely to be invited to family events because they were with the person they were caring for felt much closer to, um, to Israeli Jews than the people who were working in building sites who had much more limited contact. So one of the, um, one of the, the people we spoke with was describing how they celebrate <coughs> holidays. And he was saying, yes, indeed, we have holidays. When the Israelis have holidays, we celebrate. But we don't know how they do it. We just do it our own way so that we can enjoy it. Um, we also found that they had a lot of, when we tried to ask them about what it was to be permanent in Israel. And although many of them, like foreign workers the world over, planned for short stays, they found that after 10, 20, the longest person that we interviewed who stayed in Israel was there for 23 years. He had expected to come for three. Um, but like most of them, time runs away, you have children, and things happen, and you stay. Um, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary worker policy. So this is really, we asked them about what it was to be permanent. And we saw the full end of the spectrum. We heard people saying that we're not going to live here, we just need a job. And yes, people go back. But even in states like the United States, I should point out, one third of the people who come to the US with the intention of staying here permanently go back to their homeland. So it would not be unusual that people who intend to stay for a short period of time um, stay for a short period of time. However, most of them sounded much more like this. It doesn't matter here. I work hard, sure, but I have no worries. My children, they walk on the street all night like the kids here do, and I don't worry. There's freedom here. And, like, and we heard a lot of people truly imploring the Israeli government. We asked them, what message would you give the Israeli government if you could say anything to them? And this woman, in absolute tears, was begging to stay in Israel because they had found a home and that they wanted to remain in Israel. And she says, so that our dreams will be lost, for the lives they are having right now will be, will be lost, will be lost, get lost, they will be lost. It was really very much an idea that this is home. And after this period of time, they felt like they belonged. <coughs> um, their identity was very much a question of being Israeli, not in the sense of ethnically Israeli, but that they were of the place of Israel that they belong to Israel as an, as an entity, not part of the Israeli people. 
And this was a, really a, a phenomenal um, interview with someone who was a, a South African journalist who left um, South Africa to come to Israel for work. And she explained to us um, that she was that, uh, she's sleeping in my house with your keys. So you know when somebody, when some, you have somebody's key, that means that that person is trusted. And she felt very much that she belonged in Israel. Um, and that she had been let into the most private spaces of people's homes. So she knew that she belonged there. So what about their children? Well, there are somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000 children who are born and raised in Israel from these foreign workers, and many of them are stateless. What I mean by stateless is we saw that list of citizenship orientations. And because they don't fit into those categories, they have nothing. So they belong to no state. Um, and they have no passport, and they have nowhere to go home to. They cannot, under Israeli law, become Israeli. And for many of them, they cannot become citizens of the countries that their parents came from either. So they're stuck in this really precarious limbo. And that incidentally is why those Holocaust survivors were out there protesting for them. They were saying, we were in the position of being stateless. We know how frightening it is to belong to nowhere. Don't let this happen to these children. So where do they fit? Well, these children describe a very different experience than for their foreign worker parents. They described themselves openly as Israeli, and they felt very different than their parents who were from there, wherever they were. Um, they were very much socialized into Israeli life. So by going to Israeli schools, they would learn <coughs> typical Israeli practices, learn holidays, learn about food and songs, and, and they spoke with really um, heavily peppered Israeli, you know, Hebrew slang, words that just were more um, from the neighborhood they came from than something that they would have learned from outside. Um, their experience of being incorporated into Israel, I don't know if any of you saw this, um, the Academy Award winning short documentary called Strangers No More, it was produced by two um, producers here in, in New York City. And they looked at the school, the Alec Ragozin, about their experiences of being incorporated in Israel. It's a magnificent film. Um, and they, they really express through this, you know, their experience of being, really being totally woven into Israeli society. And in many ways, they really accepted the Israeliness without the Jewishness. And in other ways, they tweaked it. So even if their families were, um, were actively involved in their church, they would demand that the church start celebrating certain Jewish holidays. All churches in Israel celebrate Purim, celebrate Hanukkah, celebrate traditional, um, traditional Jewish holidays. And one of the things that was really very interesting for one of the kids in the park, he was sitting there listening to a group of kids playing in the park. And the kids were talking about the costumes that they were going to wear for Purim. And they were planning to wear the costumes of the Marines, of the paratroopers, of all the different Israeli soldier units that they were going to be when they grew up. Um, so they had adopted a lot more than I think had been uh, initially expected. So one of the people that we interviewed uh, was a Filipino male who was born and raised in Israel, and he said very openly, I am Israeli. My blood may be Filipino, but I am Israeli. And he served as a paratrooper in the Israeli Air Force and kept repeating to me, I am Israeli. We also see that they adopt a lot of the negative. Um, the, <coughs> the word kushi here Kushi is a, is a derogatory term that's the equivalent in English of the N-word. And this is a word that is taken on by the children that you hear them talking about. In this case, this, uh, this um, informant explained to us how this child was talking about um, his mother and saying that uh, his mother was insisting that he learn to speak English um, instead of his native Hebrew. Um, because only Kushi speak English. And then he also explained that he would never go to Africa because there are only Kushis in Africa, so there's nothing nice about it. This was really very disturbing. She laughed throughout this, but I think it was extremely painful for her. We heard many stories like this as well. 
So, is there a future in Israel for these people? Huh? Former Prime Minister of Israel, Edward Olmert, stated that the Israeli government had to find a solution. This was in 2005, and that Israel would lose its moral standing if it evaded its responsibility toward these people, especially the children of the foreign workers. So Israel then issued an amnesty for those children who were born to parents who were legally present in Israel, who spoke Hebrew, um, and the government considered that if they pulled them out of Israel, it would be cultural exile for them. They really had no place to go. Um, this was 2005. The decisions over who got to stay were issued just a few months ago. So people were living absolutely in limbo since 2005. Citizenship as part of this amnesty was offered to children and permanent residency was offered to their parents after the children served in the Israeli military. You can say why the military. The Israeli military is a major socializing agent in Israel. Everybody serves in, in the military. Okay, put that aside. Not the religious, but everybody else serves in Israel. Most serve in the city. Um, men and women both serve in the military. And so it's a normal part of life in Israel for you to serve in the military. So was after you got, gave your service, you would then get your citizenship and your parents would get derivative permanent residency. About 460 families applied. 800 children were deemed as meeting this requirement that they, that they spoke to, that they were born and raised in Israel, and that they couldn't be removed without creating some cultural exile. 400 children, however, were slated for deportation. And beginning in February 2011, Israel began a program to mass deport foreign workers. There were a lot of protests that, um, in starting really in March 2011 when the government decided to deport the children of foreign workers. And they, it, they even created this facility um, to house the foreign worker children, including babies, before they would be deported. Inside this building, um, this is this an amazing video on, on YouTube for those of you who look at it. There is a there are life-size pictures of Winnie the Pooh, of SpongeBob, and other things to make the children feel comfortable in the deportation facility before they're deported. <coughs> I should also say that the announcement of opening this deportation facility came three days after Israel won the after this entry, um, Strangers No More won the Academy Award were showing how incredibly open and hospitable Israel was. So they really didn't miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Um, and they began really this, this process of deporting children in earnest in 2012. So this is, a, this is from a newspaper in Israel from Hadiyah, meaning the city, and the title reads, Where Were You During the Municipal Cleaning Operation? And as you can see, there's a, one of the immigration officers um, with a stranglehold on one of the foreign workers. This is from one of these protests earlier this year, and the sign reads that no children are illegal, no deportations. Um, so, but this all leads us back to this question of, you know, okay, so if they're, if they're gonna stay, are they Israeli? I mean, what does it really mean? And there is one really important citizenship problem. And that is if we go back to this question of the citizenship orientation. Israel has this Ias Sanguinis, law of, the, of, the, of blood, orientation. If they accept these children because they were born in Israel, Israel will have to switch to an Ias Soli orientation. And this means <coughs> that the decision of who's an Israeli, which was who's a Jew, will have to move from the religious authorities who have been deciding who belongs to the civil authorities. And that means really moving the religious authorities out of the Israeli government and out of their place of power. And this is a massive change um, in the political and probably is the greatest threat that Israel has had um, to, it, to its, its nation status um, since the founding of the state, and certainly moves the Israeliness to trump the Jewishness in Israel. So is it possible somehow to include the foreign workers and their children into the Israeli state, into the Jewish state, into the Israeli colony, and, it, and Israel would still be the Jewish state? Can you do both? Can you get it all? 
Well, they're going to try. So they, Israel has over <coughs> its 40 year, over its 60, 64 year history, it really has created a spectrum of accommodation. It has found ways for many different people to become members of Israel without, um, without becoming um, both members of the state and members of the nation. And this spectrum really covers a large group of people. In the first one, we see that all Jews are accepted into the state by virtue of being members of the nation. Um, and that's really true for all Jews. Israel has also provided membership in the state, citizenship in Israel, without membership in the nation. And this is very much the case for the Israeli Arab. Um, they, they, are, they hold Israeli citizenship, they can participate in Israeli elections, they can run for office, um, all of these kinds of things. And, and yet, they are not members of the Jewish nation. Israel has also provided state membership by providing a kind of attenuated national membership. They look at converts and say, even though we don't accept con converts under um, a certain converts under the current Israeli definition, we will have to make exceptions in order to, um, in order to allow um, them to participate in Jewish life in Israel. Israel also offers state membership through an affiliated national membership, what we talked about with the Russians. So 300,000 non-Jewish Russians have taken up citizenship in Israel and have been settled under the law of return as if they were Jews. And they've had a massive impact on the Israeli political scene. They moved from being nobodies in the political world to being one of the, the major parties in the Knesset, um, in the Israeli parliament. And so they, they really have changed um, the definition of what it is to be Israeli. And further, they push the laws in a direction they don't want rights to be based on Jewishness, because they're not Jews. They want rights to be based on Israeliness. And over the last 10 years, they pushed Israel in a very different kind of um, direction. Then they have a complete you know, redetermination, recategorization. Um, the, what's called the Beta Israel. These are the, the Ethiopian Jews who came to Israel. In the 1970s, they were still considered non-Jews, and no one would bring them to Israel. In the 1980s, a decision was made that Israel needed to change its mind, and they were renamed <laughs> Jews. And because of that, they were airlifted, 120,000 of them were airlifted and brought to Israel um, in, in 1986 and 1990, and resettled in Israel. So they went from being non-Jews to being Jews by, by just a recategorization. And they, from complete exclusion to state and national membership to complete redefinition and being both state and national members. Then we have this group from Chicago that are called the Black Hebrews. In 1969, they came to Israel and they demanded Israeli citizenship based on the law of return. They said they were a lost tribe and somehow ended up in Chicago. <laughs> and they wanted to come home. The Israeli government said, no way. But they didn't kick them out. They stayed. They built one of the most successful kibbutz, um, collective farms in Israel, and, um, and they remained there. There are now more than 2,000 of them living predominantly in this farm. Um, and, uh, and Israel has now changed their minds about them. They have represented Israel in the Eurovision Song Festival. I don't know if you know these very kitsch songs. Twice as Israel's national representative. Um, and the Israeli government has now offered them um, permanent residency. And the Israeli government in its own communique says um, the acceptance of the black Hebrews is a sign of the maturity of the state of Israel and that they have come to terms with them. And then um, we also have this group, um, we have refugees as well, who are really an exceptional case. Israel has accepted Jewish refugees from all over the world, but it's accepted very few non-Jewish refugees, probably about 2,000 in its 64 year history. Nonetheless, as I said, there are more than 20,000 from Sudan, Eritrea, and um, South Sudan living right now in Israel and wondering if they'll be allowed to be let in. So, this poster reads, Armageddon is at our doorstep. I don't know. Um, 
this question whether the whether bringing in the foreign workers is the end of Israel you know, <coughs> as a Jewish state. I, I can honestly say through the course of our research, what we've discovered is that ethnic states around the world have found ways to accommodate if they want to. They have found ways to stretch the national definition. They found ways to skirt around the national definition, and they found ways to really redefine their own citizenship orientation. Whether this will happen in Israel, I don't know. Um, but it wouldn't be impossible. And we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. Yes. Originally, actually, the Israeli um, interior minister um, made a public statement saying, why should we allow them to go to school? We should let them sit at home and eat cereal and watch television all day. Because if we allow them to go to school, we give them the idea that they can stay and that they have a future here. That was met with an incredible amount of protest. And um, they are legally mandated to go to school like all other children. Yeah. Another um, question. If an immigrant marries a Jewish citizen, do they get a citizenship or not? So, if a, if a non Jewish person from anywhere uh, marries an Israeli, mm -hmm. it, and it really is different, an Israeli, I want to make the distinction here. If they marry a Jew, it's possible that they come in and that they get this through this um, law of return citizenship. The problem is with the Israeli Arabs. And Israel instituted in 2006 a law that said that um, the Israeli Arabs could not marry people from the territories and bring them in. So you have this duality. Yes, it's open and it's exactly closed at exactly the same time. <coughs> How did you um, find the people you were going to be bringing in? I'm sorry. And you interviewed a number of people. How did you identify who you were going to so we went out to, um, my, my research partner is very involved in the um, civic activity. And we went out and we talked to a lot of the different groups, told them what we were trying to do. They knew him from his activity. And so we made announcements asking if people would like to speak to us. Then we asked them, when we met with them, if they knew other people who might like to speak with us. Um, we went to churches, which are the usual place where people meet. Um, we went to immigrant organizations. We went to the, the, the city of Tel Aviv runs a special office um, that provides for immigrants. We talked to them as well to see if they could do some outreach and if we could just leave little cards. <coughs> and people were very open. One of the things that found is people really want to tell their story. And so they were happy to have somebody listen to them. Yeah. Uh, I was just surprised that they didn't seem to be frightened about the black box. Okay, so. Um, like in most um, of these kinds of projects, you make a lot of appointments and people don't show up. And you try to call again, and then you realize, drop it. Um, we, we did it in public places, we met with them in public places, and let them pick the place. So we said, wherever you want, it's fine. And we would get there, and not infrequently, the people would say, I don't want to be here. And we would go someplace else. And um, it was also, as people got to know and see either my research partner or the research assistants or me in either the church or something else, they would say, oh, we know them, or the pastor would say, yes, okay, you can talk to them, they're okay. So we had a lot of, like, people letting us in. Um, I mean, we also tried to use this fear to help us in some ways. If somebody was, if we were sitting with people and they looked very nervous, we would say, why are you nervous? And this would open up a whole discussion about their experiences with the police and um, their fear of deportation and, and really their, their fear of, of, of losing everything they had tried to work for. And so it, that was something that was, you know, that was helpful. But I would say, you know, you might make 10 appointments and two people show up. Or people say, I'd love to meet with you. And you go home with a whole list of phone numbers and you're so excited and not one of them turns out. 
So those who talked to us were very open. What did it many of them talk about? It was a lot. Yeah. I'm in a and I was listening to your presentation, and uh, I did most of my life I lived in Israel, not in this country. And I can tell you that the foreign workers, it's not, the picture is not as bleak as you portrayed it. I can tell you that if it were so bad, they would have gone back. Oh, I agree with you. So, uh, and I think they're getting a socially a, a 14, you said just now 14 weeks for maternity leave. Any illegal alien in this country can get it? No. I, I, as I pointed out, I myself, who was born and raised in this country, did not get that working as so, and, and, and mayor. There are, you know, there are small things that maybe the audience is not familiar with. Mm -hmm. When somebody goes to the army, I went to the army, I invested my two, two and a half years in the army. Meanwhile, whoever doesn't go through the army has the opportunity to work, to accumulate money. Their lives are not on the line. So, you know, for, for me, I think if I got the wrong picture, you know, just let me correct me. I just got the picture that you were a little bit more critical of the situation than the situation is really important. For example, let me just let this that that's gonna be my final point. The Sudanese that you were talking about, they are Muslim. So Israel is giving you a refuge to people who are really enemies. And you don't know who, how many of them, in comparison to where I came from, this is a bargain. That's what he was trying to say. And I, I don't know if you, you saw it, but that was really, that had a great deal of resonance to me. You're right. If people are unhappy, they'll leave. They also come to Israel for the reasons that I explained, that they, they come because the pay is better, they're more likely to get paid, the Israeli government mandates that money be put in an account that when they leave Israel, that they have like extra money, as if you had like a retirement account that is put aside for them. There are a host of, you know, the reception is very mixed. They do good things and they do bad things. They tie you to an employer, but they mandate that the employer treat you, you know, decently. If the employer treats you badly and you complain, you know, the, the government will help to support your claim against the employer. But it doesn't make it, you don't have freedom to move around and pick an employer. So there are limits. The people are invited because Israel wants their labor. They're not invited because they want them. That is a fact. And I think it's a very mixed bag. The children who live there are, they say, <coughs> vociferously, I am Israeli, this is home. I have no other. What more proof? That's, that's the other side. There isn't, yeah. Well, I'm just curious, as the children who go to school in Israel and, and they adopt all these um, Israeli and Jewish customs, do any of them end up becoming, wanting to convert to Judaism and then because of that are able to stay? So conversion is really, really, really difficult in Israel. <laughs> that's, that's a fair thing to say. The Israeli uh, Orthodox religious authorities control um, conversion. And they make it extremely difficult. And people have offered that. They said, well, why don't we just convert them? Then they're Jews and then we don't have a problem anymore. That hasn't gone over so long. Also, you have to remember, for a lot of them, they're really very devout Christians. And, devout, and some even devout Muslims. And they have found a home in Israel, despite that. But the conversion factor, you know, it, that's not the solution in Israel. It might work here, but it wouldn't work there. Well, I'm just I'm yeah. talking about those people who want to convert, who wholeheartedly want to convert. To, I, I yeah. understanding it has to be Orthodox Judaism. What happens with those people who want to keep on going through the effort? So, or is it just not for them? It's pretty unusual to be able to have a successful conversion in Israel. In fact, a lot of people who want to convert in Israel actually go to other countries yeah. to convert and then move back to Israel. Well, I know my friend converted here. She was living like an Orthodox Jew, 
she moved to Israel and was married, and they said was getting married in Israel, and they said, no, 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 you're not doing it. Because she had a uh, conservative conversion, and she she converted, but it took her a year and a half, and finally, but yeah, she she converted here originally and didn't count. So that's that's exactly how it doesn't count. So the, one of the one of the people, the families that we interviewed, the mother, they were from Colombia, and the mother sent her children to um, to a, a, a religious school, which for us was really surprising because that's just not done. And um, despite the fact that she was a devout Catholic, she sent her her child to a religious Jewish school because she thought, like parents everywhere, that the education was better. So she sent her kid where she thought the child would get a better education. But the children came home and they were really very much practicing the Judaism they learned in school, not what their mother did. So she would, they would insist on saying the prayers before they ate, they would insist on um, wearing a yarmulke, they, all of these kinds of things that the mother found very odd. And she said, look, they've become much more Israeli than Colombian. And there's nothing I can do about that. You are here too long. Yeah, there's periodic conversations in the U.S. political world about um, about solving U.S. illegal immigration with some kind of guest political program. Are there any lessons that that you think could be learned from this situation? that would enlighten that conversation? Or is it just go to it? Um, We've been having this conversation in the United States since 1860. <laughs> um, every time we put in one of these kinds of programs, the people stay. Because that's what they do everywhere in the world. They do it in Germany, they do it, they, they do it everywhere. That's what they do. Um, because normal people go someplace, they work, they set up a life, and then that's it. Okay, so you know, what we learned is, I think if we were trying not to repeat the mistake, we wouldn't enter into this problem. But when I first stumbled onto this, I was reading a newspaper in 1998, and I saw that Israel was importing 2,000 Thai workers. And I said, why would they do something that stupid to bring in these people? There's nothing for them there. They'll own, I mean, there isn't any. And, um, and that's really what interested me in this. How does the state, having looked at all over the world, that it always fails, why do they do something that they know will fail? I don't have a solution for that. I'm going to do a project that I would love to do. Are the ties still there? Yes, they are. <laughs> yes. So, first of all, thank you so much for a really, really interesting talk. And I just wanted to know what you want social justice through this work. This is a constant discussion between us. What's the right thing? Is this, and I feel that I can do more by staying much more neutral, and he feels that we have an obligation to do this as social justice. 
Um, we are working, we have, we have plans out for three different books. Um, <coughs> we have produced um, a few pieces of a few peer-reviewed journal articles. We've done some working papers. Um, and uh, we presented in a lot of different places um, on this topic. Um, I won for this summer uh, a Schusterman Fellowship to go to Israel and to um, do Israeli studies there. And I hope to continue then with this research. Um, there are a lot of different areas that are untouched. One of the pieces that we're looking at now are the meaning of remittances and what it means when people send money home. What is it that they're hoping, what they think that it means? It's not just money. It has, a, it has a much larger meaning. So that's one of them. And another one is a really interesting thing that's been going on, which is examining um, the, uh, the reception of um, foreign workers. We've seen that the United States government has played really a very important and positive role in improving circumstances in Israel, including the foreign workers. And I was shocked to find out how. how. Um, so that's something I'd like to be exploring a lot more. Is there your role? What you found out of it? Um, <coughs> yeah, are you to see yourself as an outsider? As an outsider, an outsider. Um, I like to hear people's stories. I really like to hear their stories and try to make sense of them. Um, and I like to listen to the stories of people that nobody listens to and try to give voice to them and try to make some sort of analytical sense of them. And that's where I think my role is. Yeah. What percent of the population uh, actually wants to change all these policies or the, the migrant workers? That's an absolutely great question. Um, I have to say I don't know. It is, a, it is a, so because there are a lot of different studies about what do you want to do with them. And so Israel is completely split in what the long-term solution. Everybody wants somebody to take care of their grandmother. Um, everybody wants somebody to do the dirty and dangerous jobs that nobody wants to do. But nobody wants them to stay forever. And so you get this very odd circumstance. And then also the percentage of people who say it doesn't really matter if we don't want them to stay. It's unjust not to treat people fairly and not to treat them better. Yeah. <laughs> Um, great work, very detailed, very thorough, very provocative, exciting, and inspiring to be a part of a family of yours. Um, and also know about your other work, so I can ask the question about like how you see this in relationship to the other work. Because the question is, a lot of the debate was based on the, the exceptionalism, the Israeli exceptionalism. How is that, is this, is this unique to Israel, or as a conservative, is there a unique to another country? There, and there's a tension between the democratic versus the ethnic state. So how does it fit in if it will be going to an mm -hmm. elder crisis we can have in the same country so that you know, you know, the thing is that my organization, but how does it fit in the other state? Or is there something unique to the trail here? And the political side of you, you're being pushed into having more of a uh, competitive, but as some of you, you're also being pulled to the people that will focus on it with very, you know, I think each case is studied um, independently, separately, and deeply before you begin the comparative work. I have to say that my mentor, um, the late Asha Arian, who is the father of Israeli political science, um, he would say openly, exceptionalism is no offense, and that, and that this was something that was repeated to me over and over again, that you should see Israel as any other state. I do happen to believe that it is, that the lessons that come out of it are really very much applicable to other states. What makes the, the issue of unique destiny is something that's brought up in every country. In the United States, we talk about American exceptionalism. The Germans talk about Deutsche Leitkultur, that they have their own thing. The Italians, the Spanish, the, the, same, the Japanese, um, in, in multi-ethnic Japan, this, this issue, um, a, a book about, about this issue of Japanese exceptionalism. And, um, homogeneity, it's just torn apart. And it's really very much all over the world we see this very um, this, this very similar issue. And I don't think it's unique to Israel. The way that it's presented is a unique Israeli thing. You wouldn't have people say,
saying they were coming to the United States because they wanted to step on the land where Jesus was. They're not going to say that. But they will say they want to come to the land of opportunity. They will use the words we use. Um, and probably the same for other places around the world, that they have the same image of what it is that they're going through. So what's exceptional is the specific context. But the problems, I think, are very much universal. And these problems of migratory workers to resolve where some of the other problems are dealt with. The, the obvious one is the problem of Palestinians. Uh, the, another would be the problem uh, between the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim. Major problem. And as you alluded to, the differences between the Reform and Conservative and Orthodox Jews. And then, of course, there's the, the fear of birth rate, that uh, Jews are going to be overwhelmed by non Jews. So they have, there are all of these other problems. And again, as you correctly point out, everybody has exceptions. You said that. But still, here, uh, uh, some of these other problems seem to be overriding and seem to be unavoidable and seem to be sort of obstructing the resolution of these problems with, uh, say, the the Ethiopians or the Sudanese or, or anybody else. Uh, so how do they deal with all of this? Um, last summer when I was in Israel, the whole country broke out into tent camps. And everywhere you went, people had set up tents to try to protest the price of, of housing, of cottage cheese, of <laughs> doctor's visits, of everything you could imagine. And the national discussion was, since um, since the 1960s, we have put off the issue because of the, the occupation. We have put off talking about all of the other issues that are important in Israel. And we waited until tomorrow. We're not going to solve those problems for the foreseeable future. The time has come to deal with these problems. I don't know, I don't think Israel can wait on fixing these other problems. Um, now, with 300,000, 350,000 people in a country of 7.8 million, that's a lot of people. <laughs> and really, and, and more people want to come. And you know, the problem has to be dealt with sooner rather than later. I don't think they can wait for a resolution. I don't think they have another problem. Yeah. <laughs> and you're right, all those other problems are there. I was going to ask, but you're probably not going to want to answer because you said that you, you know, you're, that this is a new country. I always thought that in France that immigrants weren't really assimilated. Isn't that what everybody always says? They live like in these kind of yeah, the spas in the world. Yeah, yeah, right. I'm really shocked how assimilated the migrants of the migrants' children are in Israeli society. That really surprised me. So is it different than most other countries? How uh, assimilated the kids get? I, I don't know. I don't know. I can say that there's, I mean, it's been a very short period of time. It's a small number of children, somewhere between 1,200 and, you know, 2,000 at most, but it's really 1,200 children is the official number. It's a small number. Is it possible to accommodate 1,200 children in, you know, in that size country? Maybe it is. Maybe if the numbers were substantially larger, it wouldn't be. Um, you know, so you said there's like 350,000 of them? I know. only have 1,200 yep. kids. Yep. And I can tell you, I sat there and I said, the math doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. And we went from place to place to place where the people who liked the immigrants or hated immigrants, people from the government, from the immigration police, you name it, they gave us the same figure. And they all had said, we checked them, nobody believed it, but because the children were forcibly removed, essentially, <coughs> many of them, that accounts for a lot of the children. So, you know, that's the, that's the, the number doesn't make sense from a demographic perspective. The math doesn't make sense. But that's the number everybody agrees with. Yeah. You spoke about how they were coming to the school, a lot of kids were going to school to report them. How did they work that process? I mean, if they have kids, do they, Finally, meet up with their parents, and what about those kids that parents may be, they have died or may not be in that country? How does that work? Maybe you deport them too. So the, the children were not deported 
from their school but leaving school. We'll put that, that that's the, so it wasn't that, that, the, that the immigration booths went into the school. They went the school. Um, and you can see the images on, you know, on YouTube of them taking the kids away. Um, the children are, are living there with their parents. So sometimes parents said they weren't going to send their children to school for fear that the children would be then picked up by the police. Then the government would say, we're not going to pick them up. And they didn't. And then the government would announce a month later, yes, we are going to pick them up. And so it's been this ongoing thing now for a long time. It's a very, you know, it's a very, in Israel especially, it has a lot of resonance because of the experience during the Holocaust. So it plays out in a very different way than probably it plays out here. I should remind you in the United States, 46,000 children are deported every year without their parents. So to give you a point of comparison. We have time to just one final question. <coughs> I'm just curious, I know Professor Schuler takes students to Haiti. Um, are there going to be opportunities uh, for students to go to Asia and Asia. <laughs> 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 if anybody, if any of the students here are interested in working on this research project with me, um, I would be absolutely delighted to meet the teachers. Please come and see me, come and talk to me, and maybe there's a possibility that I could walk into a grant if you come. It would be a lot of fun.